Welcome to Whiskey Talk, Malts and Music, brought to you by the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, here in the vaults in Leith. My name is Rick Galloway, I'm a broadcaster, author, musician and music journalist and the idea of this podcast is to bring together single cast, cast strength whiskies, and music. I ask creative people to pair up four drams with four pieces of music, we discuss their selections and we go off on tangents into their lives and careers. I hope you enjoy. Slanjava. Welcome to Malts and Music, Kareen Polwart. Very nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. We've got four drams in front of us. I've not tasted these, but you have. Yep. What was the process? How did you find the process of pairing up music and whiskey? Um, I enjoyed it. I, it was very much influenced by where I was at the time as well and what was going on and what had, what had just gone on before. Mm -hmm. um, having Because I, I was in three different locations drinking these four malts and I think that's fed into what music popped up. Like the conversations I was having, the people I was hanging out with, mm -hmm. the creatures I was hanging out with ah. have all been relevant to my choices. Oh, cool. Well, we'll hear about each one as we go through them all. Um, you're a whiskey fan, obviously, but just the idea of taking, it's quite an esoteric concept to taking a taste and kind of trying to combine it with something that you enjoy musically. Uh, did you find it hard or was it quite a simple process? Uh, no, well, no, it was maybe easier than I thought it would be because they, they all have a very particular character and I know nothing formally about whiskey. Like I know what I like and what I don't like normally. Although some of these, are, there's at least one of these would be the kind of whiskey I wouldn't maybe normally drink. Mm -hmm. um, but it had a real visceral, like it did a thing to mm -hmm. my body. So part of it was that, was just sitting and kind of going, what is this? What's happening in my body? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or what are the what are the kind of um, elements that are suggested by a wee mouthful? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, as I say, I've not tried them, and this is always exciting for me because I go through them for the first time. You're you're tasting them for the the, the second time, obviously. But um, you've chosen. You, I have got your music choices in advance, and it, I love doing this because I get so you know opened up to so many different types of music and different sort of, uh, styles and some amazing music in here. Let's crack on into okay. the first one. So right. left to right. Okay. So we're going to go for dram number one, which is called whiskey in a rum glass. It's a lowland grain whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's a second filled toasted and charred hogshead. Uh, it averages 59.3% alcohol. James, really? Yeah, yeah. So it's almost 60%. In the afternoon? Uh, oh. I know. <laughs> uh, it's 14 years old. Um, it's part of the juicy oak and vanilla flavour profile. Mm. I've got all the flavour profiles there. Okay. Um, and yes, it's a grain whiskey from Strathclyde. Let's have a... Okay. Oh, it's quite it. I can get the, the kind of... You can smell it's sweet, actually, yeah. just from this. Just yeah, from can't the... you? Oh, it's got a sweet kind of almost, well, I would say, almost a kind of citrusy nose. Should we try it? Sure. Mm. Now, green whiskies to me, um, I, again, I'm much like yourself. I'm, mm. I'm by no means an expert and I'm learning more and more about whiskey. They, they, they can be quite sharp to me and they can be... They're not as full-bodied and as rounded and wholesome as a, as a nice malt whiskey, but this this is quite it's nice. It's nice, I quite like it, yep. Um, and you, you've paired this one with Laurie Anderson and the Cronus Quartet, Everything is Floating. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about that, because it's a, quite an, a strange piece of music, but... It is. So it's from an album um, that Laurie Anderson made with the Cronus Quartet called Landfall, and the whole album is inspired by... Hurricane Sandy that hit New York City in 2012, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. I love this album. I love Laurie Anderson mm -hmm. and I love the Kronos Quartet and I think this is amazing collaboration. I was in Aberlady when I had this. Um, so two of these I drank in Aberlady when I was at my brother's house mm -hmm. just earlier this week with my kids. We were, that is the school holidays. Right, so we were, yeah. We were on our holidays and they were away down in Manchester and Liverpool visiting football stadiums. Wow, and okay. We were, and we were hanging in their house. So this happened in Aberlady. And um, we'd just been out for a walk by the shore, me and my daughter and my son. And like, it, it's amazing at Aberlady because there's such a massive bay there. So when the tide goes out, it's just you get this massive sand flat. And my daughter said, oh, wow, if it, if it was just a metre higher, that whole bit would be filled with houses. And what I thought was not that. My immediate thought was, oh, my God, if it was a the sea was a metre higher, this whole village would be like covered in 
water. Mm -hmm. So she was just thinking about the housing development. I was thinking about the catastrophic <laughs> consequences of climate change, as is my want. Yeah. Um, so we went home that night, um, had our dinner, and I had this small... And, um, and that image must have still been in my head in some measure. Because mm. it is quite a... You do, you do get a wee pop. Oh, yeah, no, um, the, it's... it's it, 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 uh, it's as I say, the grain whiskies aren't usually as rounded as, as a, a sort of malt whisky, but there's there's and there's usually a sort of spikiness, and there's definitely an edge of that. Yeah, totally. Pops in your mouth. So, so there was an element of that. We'd had that conversation about the the tides and about the water levels, mm -hmm. and there's a, there is a spiky quality to that. And I had already, I confess, this this is the last one actually that I drank in okay. chronological order. So we're drinking it first, but I drank it last. And so Laurie Anderson had already come to my mind yeah. for another reason connected with one of the other. There's a, and, and there's a lyric, I think it might be the last lyric in it, that just says, how beautiful, how magic, how catastrophic. Exactly. And, I, and actually, that's what I was getting from the place, because I love the East Lothian coast. Um, I live inland in Pathhead and Midlothian, but I go to the East Coast all the time. Mm -hmm. And I just love the first of fourth. Yeah. Um, and, and it's beautiful, but it is also... Um, yeah, it's potentially brutal. Yeah. So, so it was a little bit of those things combined. It's, there was a, like a wee residue of the conversation that we'd had um, and Laurie Anderson being in my brain and that was the track that came to mind because it is very beautiful and it's, I guess, also what I get from whiskey as opposed to other kinds of alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, I do find whiskey very meditative, like as a spirit. Um, and that's not true of all spirits. Like some spirits are, like, you know, like if, you're, if I was drinking vodka... I'd be much more up for a party. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas whiskey, I find it, it, it very mellowing. Um, so there's a meditative quality to it, and the, and this track is mm -hmm. literally in the air. It's like a, it feels like it's suspended. Yeah. And that's kind of how my body feels. Um, I, I like the Cronus Quartet and uh, Laurie Anderson as well, but I I've ne I didn't actually know that they'd collaborated on this album. So uh, this was brand new to me. Um, yeah, Laurie's spoken word in their classical music. Um, absolutely stunning track, and I'm going to go and listen back to the full album now, because as I said... I oh, know do you know it. what? And it's one of those things about... It pays... It's actually the kind of music that I would want to listen to, um, like... While drinking whiskey. Whilst drinking whiskey on a Sunday night, um, because it demands you just to sit and do nothing else. It's not music you can stick on in the background, like yep. while you're doing the dishes or something. Um, so it would be something I would just sit on, and I would just lie. It's a whole wee journey, mm -hmm. and you're in a space. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just felt like it fitted. Yeah, well, um, that's it's really interesting, and it's funny how you talk about it being a meditative thing because I think it's maybe the, the complexity of the different flavors in good whiskey, especially the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society oh, single mean, cask amazing. cast strength stuff. Yeah, I mean they're really strong, but they're also far more flavored. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think now I'm, I feel so spoilt from having drunk these delicious whiskies here that when I get a bottle of malt from the off-license, I'm like, hmm, it's only 45%. No, I know what you mean. It's like I've like normally got like a, some cheap bottle of Jura or something in my <laughs> cupboard. I'm like, it's all right, but it's not quite... I think it's also... I think there was an element of me kind of going, pay attention mm -hmm. when you get these because these are special and you're probably not going to drink whiskey as good as this. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, no, no. Um, um, I'll, I'll maybe do a bit of the... some of the tasting notes and see if you agree or, or not <laughs> with any of these. Point. So this is whiskey in a rum glass. It's says G1025. Uh, That's the number if uh, people listening or watching want to uh, search it out. What so is the G? What does that stand for? Was, That's green. Only... Green. Oh, so there's G123. I can't remember how many. 12 or uh, maybe maybe there's only 10, 12 green whiskies at the moment. as part. Because it was the only one that had a G and I was like, yeah. what's this G? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And it says, uh, tasting notes, I won't read them all, but the first sentence or so. Aromas reminiscent of rum combined cinnamon, nutmeg and nut oils with glass, sorry, grass, straw and black cherries on a bed of coriander seeds and seasoned oak. I mean, quite a few bases covered there. I'll tell you what, the rum thing's interesting though. So there's there's a, definitely a rumminess yeah, on totally. the nose. And there's a wee, there's an aptness about that when you're in the realm of sea mm -hmm. and water. Yeah. So... That's coincidental, but I, I like mean, it. talking talking <laughs> of um, high strength alcohol, I think the strongest alcohol I ever had was Navy Rum, mm. which made the party go well. Oh yeah, we say. <laughs> um, very good. <laughs> Not so meditative. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So on the tongue came an initial uh, sugary hit of toffee apples, custard, and butterscotch, followed so, by ginger. And so the I earth. totally get that because yeah. two of the four of these, 
my immediate impression was that they were sweet. Mm -hmm. They had a puddingy quality to them, and this is definitely one of the ones where I was like, oh, this is quite, this is quite sweet. And actually, if I was sitting down to have a dram, my favourite, which I can very rarely afford to buy, is a scapa. Oh, right. And that's definitely got that sweet yes. um, kind of, yeah, sweet mm. quality to it. So, yeah. It's funny, as, as I go through it, it was, um, the nose is really sweet for me. This is from my point of view. Um, and then when I tasted it, I could, it was quite alcohol heavy and a bit spiky. But the more I sip through softer. it, it gets, yeah, it gets yeah. softer and sweeter. Exactly. Yeah. And Gregor at the Society who poured the drams for us earlier on, he was saying this is a good introduction, uh, introductory dram. Is it? Okay, yeah, good. So. Okay, so you've done a good job with your order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, well, I've finished that. That's how good it was. Uh, amazing. Um, well, what a great introduction uh, to this episode. Um, everything is floating. Laurie Anson, Kronos Quartet. Uh, the 2018 album, Landfall, which I'm going to go and dig into properly. Um, great stuff. I'm going to have a little mouth cleanser. Yeah, me too. Mm. Um, just before we get stuck into dram number two, you, you've, you're in Pathhead now, but where mm. did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Stirlingshire, mm -hmm. uh, quite close to Denny. Mm -hmm. So um, between a wee a village called Banknock and Denny. So, kind of central belt. Um, my folks still live there. Uh, grew up on top of a hill. So when you look out the back of the house, you can see the campsies and the ochles. Mm -hmm. And when you look out the front, you can basically see the central belt, Grangemouth, Falkirk, all that kind of stuff. So we're like kind of on a cusp of like rural, urban. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, everyone talks about the Highlands, rightly so, as being so beautiful in the Western Isles and so on. But actually, the central belt is incredible in places as well. And Stirlingshire, it's, yeah, it's got some totally. lovely countryside. Oh, I mean, actually, even just if you drive like 15 minutes in behind where my folks live, you get up onto this, there's a hill called Tom Tain. And from there, you can see all the way over to North Berwick Law and all in a clear day, all the way over to Arran. Wow. So you can literally see east west. So it's kind of amazing. And you get this sense of the Clyde Valley and the Forth Valley, you can see the both of them. I would like to hill. do that. I mean, it's beautiful I, and it's totally accessible. accessible You've got yeah. this brilliant, there's a brilliant road. If you go to Kilsyth, there's a road called the Tack Medoon Road. Mm -hmm. You actually go up um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and you park up there and just walk up the hill and it's really accessible. Mm -hmm. But honestly, on a clear day, spectacular east-west vista. Mm. And it's such an overlooked bit of, the, bit of the country. And I sort of feel the same about where I live now because Midlothian is sort of a wee transit county. You know, people are, people are, yeah, going not, either to yeah, Glasgow or Edinburgh exactly. or wherever it may be. Or they're heading south, you know, yeah. through the borders to, to England. Um, so there's an element about that that's the same. I feel the same when I go up onto Sutra, which is like in the, you know, on, on the Lammermuirs. Mm -hmm. And you get this amazing vista over the Forth Valley as well. So I like that being on the edge of things, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. I'm probably the same distance from Edinburgh now as I was from Glasgow growing up. Yeah. And I quite like that, living in a quiet place but not being very far away. Yes, I think that, uh, that's the sort of dream. I'm I'm in the city. I love Edinburgh. I live in Leith, actually, not far from here, and I love it. But I'm I grew up in Fife, so I'm the the, the country is pulling me. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But I also like being having access. Yeah, totally, mm. absolutely. No, I'm quite envious of your 15 minute walk to your house tonight. <laughs> Especially after four <laughs> drams. Um, you know, l let's get into dr okay, uh, dram yeah. number two. But just What's while the etiquette on like a wee spot of water, is that? Oh, oh, please, please add that? away. I'm I mean, that, so. um, I I usually do the neat but I sometimes add a bit of water at the end so Spend we're going into Spend dram number two which is called Curtain Twitcher's Tea Time <laughs> uh, it's in an X red wine cask it's a Highland whiskey okay. uh, second fill charred X red wine barrique uh, this one is 60.3 percent alcohol oh volume yeah uh, I've got I've got a bottle at the moment in the house which is 66.9 right. it's I mean some of these oh are you goodness, have to be right. very so you're right to put water okay. in it so the meditative Thing is the right thing, I think. Yeah. So it's like, what are you going to do after 60%? Okay. 12 years old, this is. It's a 12 year old. Uh, spicy and sweet is the uh, flavour profile. Okay. And uh, it's uh, Glen Ord, actually, from the Singleton Distillery. Uh, as I say, I've not tried this, so. Oh, quite a different nose. There's a, 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 um, a hint of sweetness, but maybe a slightly sort of whiny kind of sourness yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. But it is, it is quite sweet on the nose. Definitely still quite sweet on the nose, yet. Oh, it's nice. Wow. 
I, I often think this is what a great way to earn a living. It's not bad, <laughs> yeah. is it? So... Um, now, okay. Let's let's go in. Let's have a sip. Mm, wow, it's funny. I I mean, I often say this during the podcast and to, to friends at home and so on. The difference in tastes between things that are called whiskey. Yeah, it's totally. quite quite different. And uh, for me, I've got the, the the roof of the mouth um, has been hit with the flavour. Oh, interesting. Because for me, it's, it's like the, the wings of oh really my tongue. Yeah, right. whereas the other one hit the back. Mm. What is that? I'm sure there's some science about that. <laughs> but mm. that's what I'm noticing is like it's made my mouth wider. Right. Yeah. And, my, my, and mine taller. taller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, me, it's medicine. Mm. Oh, it, it, I mean, it really Obviously. is. Oh, so delicious. Right, I'll give some tasting oh, notes wow. out. Kurt, Kurt and Twitcher's Tea Time. Isn't that a great name? That's quite name? a good name. Yeah. Um, initial impressions were bags of chocolate oranges, red grapes, malt loaf, unsmoked bacon rolls with chocolate brown sauce. And... I'm, just, I'm just stopping you at the chocolate orange. You think so? Because I'm actually suddenly just getting a wee... Mm. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I th I, I'm getting a bit of malt loaf as well. As well, I'm not sure about unsmoked bacon rolls yet, though. Let me have another sip to make sure. No, I'm getting... But that's... Do you know what? I don't know if you... We always got, like, a... Terry's chocolate orange in our stocking. Did Me you? too, yeah. And I just, I had a wee, a wee retro reminiscence there. A week, it was like, a week, it I was mean, Christmas, of, Christmas. often these tasting notes are quite suggestive, but sometimes they just, they bring up things that you didn't know that you knew. Malt loaf is interesting. I used to, when I was at school, I was, went to Denny High School, and I would often buy a Sorin malt loaf for my lunch. Mm -hmm. And just have a sorin malt loaf. Oh well, why not? It's like, I quite like it. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's not, it's not like and, you're maybe and, not hitting all your vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with about an inch of butter, or well, maybe <laughs> half an inch of butter on it. That's that's for me. Um, mm, yeah. So uh, they're saying balsamic reduction as well, dark cherry liqueur. It says a real muddled punch of a dram. Uh, reduction enhanced oh. the fruitiness, bringing blackcurrant, stodgy strawberry jam, some creamy mascarpone on a scone, uh, ginger <laughs> nut. I mean, it's like oh, no. ginger nut biscuits. That's quite specific. I'm, I am getting, getting it now. I'm getting it now all down the back of my throat. Me too. Yeah. Which is quite lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's no, it's a real warming dram. This. It's lovely. That's um, yeah, I like this one. I need to. I need to. Yeah, be having this one over the first one. If yes, it was a competition. I, Not that it is, but I'm just saying. No, I, yeah. I think I think that's. We should definitely be honest about that. Which one you prefer? Um, I think I'm with you on that as well. Although I did like the sort of fruity zinginess of the first one. This one's much more. This is much richer. It is. It's more syrupy as well somehow. Yeah. Um, well, we you know growing up in in Stirlingshire and, and near Denny and so on. How about music? Was it a musical household? Because that's, you're now, oh. you know, a singer, songwriter, acclaimed and continually working and releasing music. I mean, I mean how did it sound? I mean, weirdly, like, when, like, you know, I play with my brother a lot. So mm -hmm. my brother's a musician. He teaches guitar and when, and when I play often, I'm playing with my brother. He's, I mean, yeah, he's in the band, isn't yeah, he? He's, yeah, so he's in my, like, regular trio with my pal Inga Thompson. Mm -hmm. He's called Stephen. Um, so he's a musician and a music teacher, so music is a massive part of his life. My sister was previously in a band called The Poems, so she ended up in a band. Even my youngest brother, mm -hmm. <laughs> who's an engineer, like played in bands for a while. Um, so it, it was kind of musical, probably in the way that everybody else's house was musical. You know, there was, we, we would be singing along to records in the car, and yeah. um, but we never sang in the house or anything like that. I think people sometimes think when you've when you've come to music through f like folk music, you know, that you've, you've got like a Kaylee every weekend or something like that in your house. And it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, but my mum used to sing when she was younger um, in choirs. My dad would occasionally play the Muthi. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I mean, the biggest influence, to be honest, was a local school teacher called Malcolm Cowie, who, who was who taught at the primary school in Banknock, and he ran a band called the Banknock Kids. Mm -hmm. So when I was 10, I joined the village band, um, and there was about, I mean, maybe 14 of us or something, enough that you could fit in the minibus. And we right. met every, <laughs> basically that was it. Was, if you can fit in the minibus, that's it, that's yes. the band. Yeah. Um, and so there was a bunch of, you know, maybe four or five younger kids from the primary school, and then there was 
two big glasses that were maybe, I mean, they seemed ancient and glamorous at the time, and they were. Um, they were about 15. Called, right. Um, called Anne-Marie and Christine, and then there was, they sang, and then there was Joe that played the bass and Colin that played the guitar, and Malcolm, the teacher, played the guitar, acoustic guitar, and then the local taxi driver, Jackie, played the drums. So um, I used to go every Saturday morning and rehearse for the band, and we would do gigs in community centres and cottage hospitals. Um, yeah, all over Central Belt. So it was like, we'd play at Strathcairn Hospice and um, the Royal Larbor and, you know, old folks' homes. And, and did that, like that sort of give you the bug to perform? Well, and to, in you... retrospect, I think it probably did. I mean, I was, a, I was a really shy kid, like proper shy. I mean, like, would, would blush at the drop of a hat. And I, I mean, the truth is, I, I think I still probably am quite shy which is not necessarily what people think about musicians. When you get up on a stage, people assume you're an extrovert, and actually 90% of musicians are totally not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in retrospect, that made me... I loved music. I mean, for, for four or five years of my childhood into teenage years, I was making music every week. And I had my songs, you know, even though I was shy, um, I had my solo spots that I would step up for. So it was things like... like I had my, my solo songs were quite eclectic. There was um, Jolene. Mm -hmm. um, Space Oddity. Wow, okay. Um, and then there was uh, Bright Eyes, so that was playing, when I was younger, that was playing on the cute factor. And so then, what we've got there, uh, we've got Dolly Parton, David, David Bowie, Bowie and Art Garfunkel. And then we've got like um, Jewish folk song, Donna Donna from Joan Baez. Right, okay. So, and that was my four, that was my hits. And they're um, all quite different. I quite mean, that's different. quite different ways of singing I mean, I think about well. it now and go, Space Oddity. I mean, my... My goodness. Round like control to <laughs> manage it I mean, you know, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I, um, those are, well, I don't know, I can't remember the Joan Baez um, uh, track, but... It was like a song about the Holocaust. Right, OK. I mean, it was like quite heavy, like, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but actually, you know, the, the songs were, we did everything from like, uh, Cat Stevens, The Beatles, Neil Young... That's um, quite forward thinking for the... It the... was amazing. It was actually, honestly... I, th I mean, I, I look at it now and go, that was a transformative experience to be involved yes. in a band. Um, and actually, you know, to go and actually have to step up and perform as part of a unit. It was, it was really beautiful. And, and, then, and Malcolm Cowie still lives in the village in Banknock, um, where my folks live in that community. Um, and so did quite a number of the band, you know. Mm -hmm. I've met a few of them in recent years at, at gigs. Um, and I honestly think if that hadn't happened... There's no way, there's no way I would be making a living. Now. It's funny how those that sort of childhood experiences, I had a really good English teacher who mm -hmm. uh, encouraged me to go into acting uh, when I was, you know, a teenager, mm -hmm. which, you know, you wouldn't, have, you felt awkward and weird. And did and you do that? Did you go to drama school? Uh, well, I did the National Youth Theatre and things like that. Oh, right, and right. Um, And that was the way my parents thought I was, and, and the school thought I was going to go, but I went into rock and roll uh, <laughs> instead. But, but it, you know, it was, you need, whether it be people in your family or your school or just your local yeah, community yeah, yeah. to encourage and pull those things out of you, because it, it can literally change your life. Oh, totally. I mean, I, mean I feel that, I mean, 100%. And it wasn't the school system. It was this one teacher that gave up tons of time, like tons of extra time, to the community to run this band. Um, yeah, so I never did music formally at school, you know, like never have, have, have no qualifications, can barely read a score. Mm -hmm. But actually, I spent four or five years, like really important years, gigging yeah. and learning, learning songs, like tons of songs and learning harmonies um, and being part of something. And I think that, I think that really mattered later on when I left home and discovered the folk scene it was the closest thing I could find to that because it was all about being in a room with a group of people making a sound in the moment. Well, let's um, let's talk about the folk scene in a second, but um, we should uh, finish this before one. before we finish, finish this round. Our sixty percent. We, well, we should we should pair it up with some music, yeah, well, uh, which is why we're here. Which and one you've is this? and you've chosen Declan O'Rourke and Sarah. Oh, so this is the other Aber Lady one. So these first two are my wee my wee um, holiday to to live in my brother's house. Yeah. Um, which is a much nicer, warmer, brighter, bonnier house than the mm -hmm. house we live in. Um, oh. It's quite it's funny, that, isn't it? And the it? reason we were there is because they, they have a dog. They've got a dog who's um, she's just over a year old called Daisy. She's a beautiful, beautiful dog. She's a Labradoodle. 
And they were away on this trip and they couldn't take the dog. And my kids are constantly on at me to get a dog. And we can't really have a dog right now until I work out how to make a living that doesn't involve going away. Mm -hmm. It's not really possible to be in a, a lone adult household and have a dog. Yeah. <laughs> so we are con we're, we're like the number one on-call dog sitters for our pals. Yeah. Um, anyway, we had an absolutely brilliant time um, with Daisy. Uh, I mean, I, I loved it. And like a teacher right on the edge of going, like, get me on the RSPCA website. Yeah. <laughs> and get us a wee spaniel. Yeah. Um, Anyway, Declan O'Rook Sarah, I saw him play, first of all, I think he's brilliant. So he's like one of my peers in an yes. Irish context. Um, so he's from Dublin. Um, I, I would think of him as the closest peer to what I do in an Irish context, because mm -hmm. he's coming from a folk tradition, but he's a songwriter, he's collaborating with musicians of all different kinds. Um, and he's got, he's got stories to tell He's trying to, like, kind of, I guess, um, dig into the past and big stories from Ireland, but but kind of present it in a kind of contemporary way. So I think he's brilliant. I love his voice. And I first saw him perform in Barbrell in Glasgow. Oh, wow, yeah, that's a small yeah, spot. Teeny, yeah, teeny wee venue. And actually, my sister was working in Brell at the time, I think. She wasn't on that night, but she worked, she worked in Brell. So there was about 50 people in the audience, and, and Eddie Reader was there, um, and she'd just invited him to go on tour with her as her support. Mm -hmm. And um, Joe Mangle was there as well. Yeah, Love yeah, Joe Mangle. Yeah. So she was the support for Declan O'Rourke and Eddie was in the audience. And I just thought he was fantastic. And he sang this song, Sarah, mm -hmm. just himself. And he said, this is a song I wrote about my dog. <laughs> right, OK. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a... I don't know. It's like a, it sounds like a, like a heart sore love song mm -hmm. for somebody... It's like there's a bit of kind of nostalgia about it, and but you fall in, you do you do have a a, a, a relationship with a dog. I mean, oh. I am a huge dog lover as well, and and so I mean, it, you, wait, if you lose a dog and you know growing oh, up or whatever, it's like so, it's part of the family. Yeah, and we had a dog growing up as well, um, but I've never had a dog living in my house as an adult. But anyway, when he told this story, he said, "I wrote this song for my dog." Oh my God, the audience. Like, there was something about him just giving you that one piece of information and then singing the song that was like, oh, I'm just like. And everyone was blubbing, like, basically. Like, totally, yeah. like just an entire weeping audience. Yeah. So, it's a. Uh, so, there's something about it that's just really beautiful and heartfelt. And I think fair play to write a love song for your dog. And have you have you uh, played shows with him or do you I've know him? I've done, I've done, I've been on the bill with him, um, yeah, many times. Um, I've never collaborated with him and I would love to do that, actually. So, there's a wee. There we go. A well, Declan, if you're listening or watching, tossed into the universe. Yeah. I think he's absolutely magic, and I think he's, he's got, got a lovely voice. I it's mean, like, it, it's like butter, or no, it, deeper than butter. It's like molasses. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, like? something like treacle. Yeah. Um, but um, the, 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 part of his voice, I mean, you may disagree with me here, but I, it reminds me occasionally of uh, Rufus Wainwright, his voice. Oh, he's got totally. that kind of... Uh... Oh, he's got, I mean, he's got an agility about his voice that's incredible. He's got a song called Galileo, um, which, which Eddie covered in her own way, that is just, it's like vocal gymnastics. It's absolutely exquisite. And it's about Galileo Galilei. Yeah. Like, again, so I, what I love is his ability to make these beautiful songs about odd little sideways subjects. And matters. why why did it go particularly well with this dram, do you think? Or was it just the time and place? And... Well, it was very much, I was literally sitting, drinking it with Daisy the dog, mm. like lying on my feet. And I was like, this is what we need this a dram song is. for the dog. Yeah. And, and, and there were two things that came up, and this connects to Laurie Anderson. It was either, she has an amazing album called Heart of a Dog, which is about the loss of her dog, mm -hmm. Lola Bell. So I was like, is it Laurie Anderson or is it Declan O'Rourke? Because I was like, these are both. And I was like, let's... Let's go with Declan. Let's go with Sarah. Well, uh, so, you, you know, you're a fan, as is Christy Moore, Pete Townsend, Paul Weller, all sorts of people are championing him. And, I mean, he's he must be doing quite well for himself now. But it may He's be a novelist as well. Oh, is he? I mean, I think this is one of the things that I really feel like, oh, my goodness, he's got... Well, a bunch yeah, of things I mean, that you write as well. You're a, yeah, you're, totally. you're so there's, and so does James York. Then there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a, a wee bunch of musicians that are stepping into that realm of writing. Catherine Williams would be another. Um, 
and that's really interesting to me because I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. What being a musician brings to your writing? Well, to to me, you, I mean, you have an extremely melodic, pure singing voice. There are loads of people who can uh, dance around the melody. Or they might not be the greatest singers of all time, but you have a really precise, beautiful, pure voice, and. Yet, I often think that it's the words that are the the first thing that come from you. Um, t tell me I'm wrong. No, I think that's kind of true. You're, you're a word-driven person, even though you're a very melodic and pure singer as no, well. No, no, I would say that. Like, I'm, there's always something to say. Yeah. If you know what I mean. And I, and I don't think that's always true. Like, I've collaborated a lot now with other writers over the past 15 years or mm. so. And it's been really interesting to notice that some people are, all the feeling of what they're doing is in the sound. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of folk like, I had a, a, just one tiny experience of working with uh, James Graham from the Twilight Sands. Yeah. And his whole vibe was about, um, he, he was literally gibberishing. Like yeah. to make up the melody, it was, it was kind of emerging out of like the sound. Well, um, I think maybe McCartney, good old Paul McCartney, I think he would come out, well, you know, the classic uh, yesterday started oh, as totally. scrambled eggs. But, it, but, but, but it's got real, like, way and, and it's proper feeling, but it's not starting with words. But yes. for me, it's like I've always got something yeah. to say, if you mm. know what I mean. Mm. Um, and I think Declan O'Rourke does too. So I feel like... I don't so really, when you're I don't writing, really, I don't really you'll, have a, you'll have a line or a, or a verse or a... I've a, got a page of stuff. And they come together, um, you know, like melody and, and lyric. Are, it's not like I've got a lyric and I set it to music. It's, it's a bit of a swimmy kind yes. of process, if you know what I mean. But I think I always know, like, where I'm heading. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Declan O'Rourke does too. So when I hear him, I think, I, I understand your craft. Yeah, well, I think it's a fine choice and then, uh, to go with a fine dram. Uh, shall we move on? Yes. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> I mean, as, 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 as much as I'm enjoying this dram, there's not much <laughs> left of it. You know? So dram number three, yes. Karine, is called Tea Tree Tobacco Leaves. Uh, it's an ex-Isla barrel, Speyside, which is quite interesting, Isla and uh, Speyside together. Second fill, ex-Isla barrel, 66.1%. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> Eight-year-old, this one, and it's part of the spicy and dry flavour profiles here at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. It's a Glendeveron, which is a Macduff distillery whiskey, which I've never been to. I'd love to go up there. Okay. Um, let's have a quick okay. sniff. Again, a completely different oh, nose goodness. from the last couple. God, I wish I had better words for smell. It's a really interesting thing to go... I was reading an article today about smell being the fundamental sense mm -hmm. that we've kind of like moved away from as humans. And there's a bit of me is like, I wish I had a better capacity yeah. to describe I'm, smell. Well, the, for me to describe the senses other than... Um, Sight and uh, sound? Yeah, and, and even, you know, even love, you know, even, you know, it's, it's the forever... The thing that you're forever trying to describe is your heartbreak or your, yeah, you, know, yeah, yeah. you know, falling in love. But s describing smell <laughs> is quite hard. different. It's, I mean, there's quite a bit of alcohol on the nose, I think. Um, but again, a sweetness, but a different kind of sweetness, less fruity and more it kind of caramelised or yeah, something. Yeah, although it's the first one I, I would say that is a little bit... What's the word for... Um, I'm not mean. I'm not trying to offend it. It's got it's got the most gluey quality to of the of the three. Oh right, yeah, glue. Oh yeah, that's strange actually. It's funny, but because the tasting notes suggest things to you. I mean, when, now that you've suggested that, I can get that kind of glueiness as well. But it also has a sweetness to it. It does. It does. So here we go. T uh, tea tree tobacco leaves. Okay. Um, it's six fifty six. By the way, if you're looking for it, if you're listening or watching and you're looking for it. Uh, and I should have said that the Curtain Twitchers Tea Time, which is the last one we had, was a 77.68. I didn't say that at the time, I apologize for that. So this is a 6.56 and it says, aromas were rich and sweet with an abundance of toffee, chocolate and coffee dregs mixed with caramel shortbread, condensed milk and charred oak. Instantly the palate was and alive what, with- what milk? Uh, condensed with condensed milk, milk and, and charred oak. 
I'm not getting the okay. charred oak, I have okay. to say, but it says instantly the palate was alive with menthol, hints of Me tea. So menthol is what I'm getting. Yeah, that's what I meant glue. by the glue. Yeah. So, okay. Hints of tea tree oil and forest floors joining ginger, walnuts, and poached pears. Right. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I'm just on the smell just now, so. Oof. Oh, yeah. I'm now getting the oak, definitely the oak, on. Yeah. Um, and I'm getting the, the caramel as well. And a bit of the menthol. The menthol and the oak, it's quite a... Yet yeah, oh, again. I like that. I like, really like that. That's a... This is a deep dram, though. This is, this is a contemplative... For me, anyway. Contemplative end of the night by the roaring fire. Yeah. This is a blow-your-head-off dram to yeah, me. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Is this the one that I... So is this the Mugison one? Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. So this one... Because it has that quality, for sure. I drank this in Ullapool. I was in Ullapool last week for mm -hmm. a week. I was staying at the Cayley place. Mm -hmm. Nice in, place. In the bunkhouse. Yeah. Um, and I was on a course, um, yeah, like as a participant. Like I was, yeah. What, we, what course was it, if it you was, don't mind well, me it, had a, it had a weird name, so it was called Degrowth. It was all about, basically, how do you... How do you create a society and economy that's based on care mm -hmm. and nurturing and um, sharing mm -hmm. rather than on like hoarding wealth, basically? I mean, it's basically like old school socialist I was school. just about to say that. <laughs> no one wants to call it that anymore. But actually, I think that is actually what it was. Is it was um, a socialism course. It was a basically. socialism course yeah, no, for no, like, no, for like hippie yeah. artists and yeah. crofters. And it was really interesting. I was there as a musician, but the other participants were, there was a few folk from the arts. There was like a visual artist that lived quite nearby on the Scorig Peninsula. There was some folk that worked in dance. There was a lot of people that worked in food, like community food, Crofters, mm -hmm. um, there was a brilliant theatre maker from Sky, and we were all there fishing for ideas on how to be basically more kind. How to be better people and a better that society. Is, that yeah. is basically it. How mm. to like, like we're living in an absolute chaos time. Yeah. Um, and the people that kind of govern everything are patently don't care. <laughs> so what can you do in your own sphere of work and influence and life to kind of like resist? That was basically what it was about. So, and, and the Cayley Place I love, I've, I've been to the, I went to the Cayley Place first in 1993. Mm. Oh, it, wow. it was the first place I ever paid for a bed. Right. Like as a punter. As an adult, yes, I went with my first ever boyfriend, and we were like, "Let's go to the Kelly place." Um, that sounds great. Um, and we had a double bunk room in the Kelly place. Um, I think it's amazing. I think there are brilliant people that run the place. Um, they've got a real spirit of like community, and it's not about profiteering. I've DJed in there at Loopaloo oh. Festival I, I, many, many times, uh, as well as the Seaforth just round the corner. Oh, nice. And um, it's such, I mean, I always say this, I've DJed in Ibiza and uh -huh. all these sort of so-called glamorous places. Hullapool, best crowd in the world, certainly for me anyway. Oh, it was absolutely I, jumping, totally. great, great atmosphere, friendliness, fun, wildness as well. People. If there were chandeliers, they'd be swinging from them. Yeah, uh, totally. Great place, though. Oh, Good I, food. I, mean, I love it. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant place. I've been there, like, as a punter. I've been there to do gigs. I've been there as a teacher. Like, I've done all kinds. And I've been there as a participant on a course. Um, so I think it's great. So this, I drank there. Right, OK. And that is partly what influences the, so the choice. So you've gone for, you said Muggison. Is that yeah. how you say his name? I, 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 as a, well, as I know, just, an I idiot, I would just say Muggison. But so uh, Muggison is probably... You're going to Iceland, aren't you? I am. And by the way, I've seen Muggison okay. uh, uh, two, three times live uh, in various different, you know, on his own, with a duo, with a full band. Yeah. And he's, he's fantastic. I think and he's this, a serious talent. I, well, I, I think he's great, but this is quite, a, this is a wee bit of an outlier track. It is, yeah. Because his stuff is a bit heavier and more electronic and yeah. kind of like it's all soundscapey and it's kind of more maybe what you'd think of when you think of Icelandic music. Yeah. But this is so, I love this. It was sent to me by a friend of mine um, from Vancouver um, called Doug Lang. 
and it's a spoken word story piece, mm -hmm. like with a kind of basically with a wee chamber mm -hmm. kind of ensemble called Salt. So basically, this is inspired by Ullapool and Loch Broom, which is a sea loch, because we went down like a bunch of hippie socialists <laughs> um, and we did the whole like splashing our faces with water from Loch Broom and it was salty, so I like tasted of salt for the whole day. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, when I had my drama, I was like, oh, salt. Um, I think it's beautiful. It's a little myth, really, about how salt is born and about how tears are born. I just think it's the most exquisite thing. Honestly, if I had five pieces of music that I could keep... You, forever. This forever. Would be, yeah. This would be one of the Oh, that's interesting. It, because it is slightly unusual for uh, Muggison, who is an unusual artist anyway. And uh, yeah, so it's slightly... Uh, almost childlike, I'm not sure if it is a child. Well, I, I, but... I think, it, I think the, the, the voice, I, I read somewhere, I couldn't find it recently, but might have, was his neighbour? So mm -hmm. I don't know if it was his neighbour or his neighbour's daughter. Child, yeah, daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a child speaking, and it's got the quality of myth and old story about it, and I just think it's yeah. beautiful. And with that Icelandic accent as well, it sort of lends itself some kind of uh, uh, sort of exoticism as well, but also kind of... Darkness. Darkness, yeah, oh, yeah. Like a, oh, wow. It's kind of elemental, and I, I love it for that. Um, yeah, so Ullapool to Reykjavik. Okay, um, Ullapool to Reykjavik via uh, Glendeveren, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, a, yeah, a space-side, you know, whiskey here. So, yeah, so we're getting a, a good um, kind of span of the of the landscape there. Uh, yeah, I love this, and it's it's almost 20 years old. Well, it's 2004. Is it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, as I say, I've seen him live a few times and always, always blown away. Yeah, um, I think he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I, I'm actually, so. I was so glad you picked this because I hadn't heard this particular track and I hadn't listened to his music for a long time. Yeah. I, he's sort of gone off my radar a little bit, so it was great to connect with it and again and realise how talented he is and how diverse and sort of eclectic. Really good. We were talking about a couple of drams ago, the folk scene. Did you oh, grow, grow up mean, listening to traditional music? No, really not. Like, I mean, I grew up listening to, like... Top of the Pops, you know. Big Country and U2 and Eurythmics yeah. and, like, 80s classics. Um, I think what I realised is there's a big thread of... that comes through family and, to some extent, through school. Things like burn songs, like, they got forced upon you. Um, I actually loved them. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. even though they were forced on you. So, I, I did, even when I was a kid. Um, I, mean, I remember getting given a book of my great grandfather's that was like a book of Burns songs and poems. It was a totally beat up, wee green leather bound thing. And I, I mean, I proper. Yeah, which, have you still like, got it? Proper cherished it. It got burnt in a fire. <laughs> oh, no, believe? that's a shame. In Leith. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, disaster. Oh, we're in Leith. Disaster. Um, Sorry, Leith. Anyway, but. Um, but, it, but actually, I loved, I think I loved that stuff. Um, so no, I didn't have any, there was nothing really folky about my upbringing. Mm. But when I found the folk scene, I totally felt like, oh, wait a minute, I understand this. So there was just an, an absolute, and it was through artists, like actually with a Leith connection, the, the, the big key for me was Dick Gawkin, mm. who's from Leith. And I think once I discovered his music, I was And like, another political... Totally, Singer songwriter, and but also has an amazing way, quality, like able to talk about what's happening now, um, and speak to the past as well. Um, that's what made me love folk music. Mm. So, and Mugison is in that pocket. This is folklore in a kind of contemporary form. Yeah. That's uh, uh, nice. That's, that, you should have a job in the radio. <laughs> that was you know, <laughs> weaving the magic there. Um, yeah, the, it's it's funny. You know, as I said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you agreed. It's that the words are often the impetus, if not the impetus b behind your songs. But there, there's a, a politicization, if you like, or a, a sort of polemic side to you, even though they're the emotional songs and they're intimate songs, there is an, a sort of activism and anger, a, a, politis, you know, a, po a politics to what you're doing. You studied philosophy before you got into music. Do you, think, do you think that's... Connected? Yeah, no, basically, I think I'm doing philosophy through the means of music. Yeah. That's basically it. I feel like I'm doing the same thing as I, I did. I, I studied philosophy, I taught philosophy, I facilitated philosophy in community settings, and then I worked in kind of like social activist settings, 
and then I became a musician when I was basically nearly 30. Yeah, and I, that, like, I was going to say that as so well. So it's quite late, you know, and I feel like all of those things are entirely coherent. So I can map the line to now. Easy peasy. And, and for people who say, you know, I, I don't go near, I'm a musician or, you know, songwriter, but I don't go near politics, it feels like the personal is political to you. Oh, massively. And I think, I, th I mean, I think that's the way to, it, like music, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of like polemic music. Well, I don't think your yeah, music, you know your I mean? songs no, are but I'm, kind but of... I'm not, but, I, but I, think that, I think actually telling stories is a political act because you make a choice about what's important, what you want to say, who's important, you know, and, and your values are kind of like come through your music. So I think even loads of musicians that don't consider themselves political have are. got... Actually are. Yeah. yeah totally. Well, I mean, I grew up and, and still do love, you know, the clash and things like that. They were overtly sort of uh, political and yeah, so on. Too. And yet and yet they were kind of singing songs about just people really. But so there are certain there are certain songwriters to me that can that can wave a flag if you like or much as I hate flags, but you know, can sh can shout from the rooftops about a specific issue. Yeah. Um but keep it personal. Yeah. Um, but then there are other people that can and it's often like, oh, it's, I find it cringeworthy when people are trying to ram a message down your throat. Yeah. I never listen to your music and think, God, she's trying to twist my arm behind my back here or no. force me to believe something she's saying. It's your storytelling, you're leading the listener. You're making a wee world and that is what Mugison has done is doing on salt. this, yeah. I yeah. Think so. yeah. Okay, brilliant piece of music, great choice. Uh, tea tree tobacco leaves is paired with Mugison, the Icelandic songwriter, you know, sound inventor, whatever. I'm going to have another palate cleanser. Final dram, Kareen. Yes. Um, is a 135.37. It's called Pickle Me Timbers. I love, I love the maths of this. It's like, it's super spotty. I know, I know it is. And I'm it, like, it, what does that database look like? Well, it's the, the first number is the number of the distillery and the second number is the, the batch. One five. Yeah. So there's, oh I mean... I mean, I, how many are there? I, I, I mean, it's ever growing in Scotland and there are distilleries popping up all, all right. over the place, but I think they're into the 150s now. Oh God, right. Dotted all around wow. the country. Wow. And there was a time when they were all being shut down right. and that whiskey was yesterday's news. Uh, it's it's amazing how wow. things flip wow. and change, and now it's you know it's, it's yeah. great, it's great. <laughs> and and talking to Muggeson, I'm off to Iceland to look at the um, Einverk Distillery uh, in, in a wee while, which is going to be exciting. Anyway, um, pickle me timbers. It's a second fill ex bourbon peated uh, whiskey, uh, a Highland whiskey. It's a, as I say, fifty nine point one percent. Okay. Ten year old. Disappointing. I know. <laughs> after after our uh, after our last one, which was sixty six point one, yeah, only under the sixties this time. Uh, a ten year old is peated. If you're looking at the flavour profiles, and it's an inch moan, so it's a Loch Lomond Distillery. This okay. one, okay. and you have paired it with. I'm going to say this wrong, even though I should be able to speak some kind of potential Greek because my dad lived there for a while. Alkinos, you um, and Ioannidis. Yeah, Alkinos. Ioannidis. Ioannidis, yeah. So. Ioannidis. Yeah, yeah. Ioannidis um, is the artist, and oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, oh. Apoguema sto dendro. Great. Perfect. Let's go for that. Perfect. Um, now, this is completely new to me, uh -huh. and I, of all of the music that you chose, I've liked every selection, but this one really like, took me somewhere. What an incredible voice, what an incredible arrangement. Oh my God, he's amazing. You've chosen the live version. Yeah, totally. I have, because I think this is the most um, heartful version of this song. There's, there's actually three different versions that you could find on Spotify. Yeah. Um, there's an album version, there's an orchestral version, and there's this live version. I've not heard the orchestral. I went straight for the, the album version, and, and I love the live version. The album version is stunning as well. I think it's, it's it, you know, it gets heavier towards the end. Oh, but... totally. It's brilliant. It's totally brilliant. So Alkinos is a pal. Oh, is and, he? Yeah. Right, okay. And, um, and he's a pal by a really curious route. He got in touch, I think. I mean, 
it might even be 10 years ago now, ten, nine or 10 years ago. He's a total dude. So and he's a Greek Cypriot songwriter, yes. composer. He, he composes for orchestra as well. He trained in St. Petersburg. He's an incredible musician. Um, and he's a poet and he's just a great guy. He got in touch, I think maybe 2012, 2013. And he said, he had a friend who is from Glasgow, who's like the kind of Greek diaspora in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I want to come to Celtic Connections Festival. Who should I meet? And she gave him a wee list of like four people. And I was on that list. Mm -hmm. And he got in touch going, I'm, I'm coming to Glasgow. I don't know anyone. Do you want... Do you, do you want to jam? Yeah. Do you want to meet up? And I was like, oh my God, this guy is like coming from Athens. Yeah. So I was like, and I lived like outside of Pathhead with little kids. And I was like, the guy is flying from Greece. <laughs> Make an effort. Yeah. So I went to Glasgow and I met him for a coffee for about an hour and a half. I thought he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Great. And then he got in touch about, I mean, six months later and said, um, I'm doing this project in Athens. Do you want to come? And I was like, gig in Athens? Yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Um, so I went to Athens and, I, and, I, and, then I, and then I got a real sense of what he represents. Because I, I landed in Athens for this gig, met his band. But actually, it was being out in the street with him. And like young people would meet him in the street and could, like they wanted selfies. Yeah, oh right, they okay. They wanted yeah. like signatures. And I was like, my God, this guy's a total dude. Um, because he represent, I think he, he represents something um, cultural and political. He's Cypriot, but a Greek Cypriot living in Greece. Um, and, you know, he's sort of like guddling in the same pool as me. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit like Declan O'Rourke. Like he would be the kindred spirit in a, in a Greek context um, for what I do. So he's like playing around with kind of big old stories and myth. Um, and traditional forms, but he's he's a god. Like he's literally like, oh my god. Uh, I looked at the the, the lyrical translation of the, of of this particular song, and it's 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 epic. It's epic. Well, he's he also interestingly, both of us studied philosophy, mm -hmm. and we're the same age. All Greeks study philosophy. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> no, they but, probably don't. But, but the, you reason, know, the reason they I, do. the reason I picked this this um, track is because he came to visit. Um, about a month ago, six weeks ago, he came with his wife um, and his three kids and a friend and her two daughters. And I, I live in a wee semi-detached house in like Pathhead. And I literally like converted my entire house into like some kind of Airbnb. It was like, oh my God, eight people. Right, every yeah. cushion, every like mattress topper, like, um, and they came for a holiday to Britain. They went, they went to England and they came to Scotland for like 10 days and I was like come they came for three nights and I've been three times to Greece to visit him I once to Cyprus um, where he's from mm -hmm. and he's been twice here to, to kind of like collaborate on projects through Celtic Connections um, but he came with his family and it was it was genuinely like beautiful so he came to Pathhead my home and um, these eight people um, in my house and there was a night that happened, the last night that they were here before they went back to Athens. Um, they sang in my house. And it was the last time before I had this first, this is the first dram. That oh, I so had. this is the first this one you had. We've done it in reverse, sorry the, about that. The previous that. time that I'd had whiskey was when Alkinos came. And he also brought, him and his wife brought me a bottle of Masticha. Right. Which yeah. is like Greek whiskey. Okay. And it's made from the mastic tree, which is like what you get. Oh, like, I must try that. Yeah. Oh my God. It is like amazing. Rocket fuel. Yeah. No but, doubt. But, but actually, no, but it's like, it's super mellow. Like mm. really, not like um, Zambuca or something like that. Right. Super mellow. Um, he came to the house um, on, on that last night, they sang. So he had his guitar out. My friend, Martin Green from Lau. Yes. So he, he lives like opposite the park from me. He came over with his son. My friend Pippa Murphy that I've collaborated with mm -hmm. came with her son who plays the pipes. And we had this amazing, like it was genuinely beautiful. My friend Patty came and everyone sang or played or harmonized in my living room, which is honestly 
my living room is not even as it's like two thirds of the size of this room. So we had about like twelve or fourteen people in my front room drinking. That's the best way. Drinking, you know it. <laughs> drinking whiskey and masticha and singing songs and it was just the most beautiful experience. And his kids, who are like between the age of like eleven and fifteen, they drew on my window in the kind of condensation on my window. Yeah, yeah. So that for like three or four weeks after Every time the window steamed up, I could see their wee smiley faces and their wee drawings on my window. I was like, oh my God, I can't like even get rid of these pictures on my window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, this is the dram that I had shortly after Alkinos and his family left. And it is the one of all the four that made me go... Mm. I know it's the peaty one. Is that right? It is. It is. Yep, yep. And it feels like fire. Oh my goodness, I've just had the first so sniff I, of I it. So I literally, it that felt... That is about as peaty on oh the nose as you'll so ever I've, get. I've like, it felt like I had, like my whole body had expanded. And I and I just thought of Alkinos. I was yeah. like, oh my God. That's what this podcast is all about. It's about sort of, you know, that gut reaction. And, and you know, you can be as as chin strokey and as, as, as kind of academic as you like, but it's got to punch you. That's why, you know, how can you pair up whiskey and music without feeling that punch to your totally. gut in some so this, way? This is the one. I really, I like this track and there's something my father used to, my father was a, 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 a very good musician, uh, went to the Royal College of Music and was a violinist oh, and all that, wow. but also played uh -huh. folk music and so on. And, but, he would go, he would just get into different types of music mm -hmm. every now and again. And there was, it, it didn't, it wasn't just a fad. He loved Greek music. Wow. And so we used to, he used to, I can remember him mowing the lawn with the record player blasting out Greek music into the garden so he could hear it over the side oh of the lawn. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just like huge. And then he ended up, like the end of his life was basically spent in Greece. So, um, on the island of Kefalonia. So... We have, as a family, my brother and I, we have a sort of connection to, obviously, my dad and Greece and Greek music. And my brother knows quite a few, he taught in Greece uh -huh. for a while, and he knows quite a few Greek songs. Wow. So, um, yeah, if, if, if we're, when we're there, we, we kind of go and see Greek songwriters well, or whatever, amazing. and he'll well, request tunes, and they'll amazing. be like, they'll be amazed like, that he okay. even knows them, you know, it's, it's well, great. Well, Alkinos, I have to say, Alkinos is like a genuine, like, um cult figure like yeah like I literally, did not... literally people stop him in the street and i went i had an experience recently i went to um sligachan sky mm -hmm. my pal sue lee who's a cellist with the scottish chamber orchestra and hamish napier who's a brilliant folk musician were getting married so that was like a month ago in sky and i went to the bar to buy a round and i and the, i was like to the guy where are you from and he went i'm from cyprus and i went you must know I was Alkinos. Like, Do you know yeah. Alkinos? And he went, I love Alkinos. Yeah. And he literally got his iPhone out and he played a song called O Proskinitis, which means the pilgrim. Right. Which I've sung with Alkinos many right. times. Okay. And he put it on his phone and I was like, I know the harmony for this. And I stood in the bar in Sky singing the counter. Harmony. Had whiskey been taken at that point? Whiskey had been taken and, and <laughs> vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a party night. Um, oh, brilliant! And but it was the most beautiful thing. I was like, oh my god, I'm in the, I'm on the Isle of Skye, with a Cypriot barman, singing the harmony from my pal's song. It was so beautiful. Yeah. And he is an absolute like he's a total gem of a human. His I, 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 I mean, are, on like, the strength. I mean, I can't commend him enough. Like, just go and listen to his back catalogue. Oh, well, on the strength of this track, it, it, you know, and the, the live version, which is the one, by the way, anyone listening, watching, enjoying this, there is a Spotify playlist, uh, the entire Maltz and Music series or series one and series two. We just keep adding tracks to the playlist. So all the tunes that you're hearing us talk about today are on this playlist. Kareen's choices will be obviously the last selection that you hear. Uh, but you can go through Ian Rankin, Val McDermott, you know, Justin Curry, Norman Blake, everyone that's been in involved in this podcast. They've, they've chosen their tracks. We've added them to the playlist. So go and check out Alkinas because it is it's magic and stuff. It really is quite. But that, that you'll get a sense on Spotify of how important he is in terms of Greek culture because O Proskinitis, that song that I mentioned, we're talking two and a half million streams. Yeah. So the guy's like. 
Big news. Big news. Okay, right, let's talk about the whiskey, and then I think that's the end of the podcast, I'm afraid, Kareen. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be here for another hour. Okay, so Pickle Me Timber, some of the tasting notes. It's a 135.37, if people are looking for it. As I say, Highland Whiskey, sec, uh, second fill, ex-bourbon hogshead, 10-year-old, uh, peated. The panel recognised this one as immediately brimming with fun and character. Lots of applewood smoke, uh, coal tar smoke, Rubber fishing wellies, <laughs> wow, wellies? Uh, cr uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> crushed chalk and smoked whitefish. Beyond that, burning bracken, silage, and sheep wool oils. <laughs> How about that? There you go. I mean, uh, there you go. Talk I'm sorry, about that's the funniest tasting silage. Of them all. I know, but you know, you were saying about being able to describe a smell. Maybe yeah. our tasting panel yeah, at yeah, the yeah. at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society—they've got it. So let's. The, the, I mean, it's it's one of the peatiest noses I've ever experienced. To me it's it's a fire. It's a it's an act it's a hearth. If you want to if you want to make it a place, this is a hearth. Yes. Although the nose is uh, the, one of the peatiest I've ever smelled. Because often a peaty whiskey the nose doesn't smell too peaty and then you hit it you know it hits the palate and it's like Whoa. it's the opposite for me. The nose is really peaty and then the palate's actually much more mellow. Yeah, but it yeah, is a... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> it's expansive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, I think this is the most unexpected dram of the four. Because mm -hmm. this is not... The peaty... The peaty whiskies are not where I would go. I right. would go for the saltier, sweeter kind of like palate. But now this is sort of like indelibly connected to my friend Alkinos. Alkinos. And, and you so said that it. right at the beginning so. of the episode is that there are certain whiskies you don't, you know, normally go for. for so for the Isla Peated stuff. All your Isla malts I would find a bit too much. Yeah. Um, but I really like that and it just hit the right um, moment in time. Um, so actually I would, I would happily drink that again. Good. Well, um, I loved all of the music that you chose. I loved all of the, 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 you know, the connections between the drams and the music, and I love chatting to you. And by the way, I've got millions of questions that we didn't even get through most. <laughs> In fact, we got hardly through any of them. Um, but you know, spoken word, theatre, countless albums. What's it, about nine albums now? Nine oh, I albums. Don't, I don't actually know. Don't know. Solo albums and lots of collaboration. Um, Kareen, you are a force of nature and you're a lovely person and it's great to Thank drink you. some drams Thank with you. Thank you for being Cheers. a guest on Thank Maltz you. and Music. You're very welcome. <laughs>